This video looks at the process of the Killing equation, how it arises from the Lie derivative of the metric for some manifold. It then interprets the solutions to the Killing equation as being isometries or symmetry directions on the given manifold. So a Killing vector field is a vector field on both Riemannian and pseudo-Riemannian manifolds that leaves the metric invariant under a change of coordinates. So you'll think of a set of points on some object on a manifold, and if they're translated in the direction of a killing vector field, the result will be no change in the relationship between the original distances between the points. So killing vector fields, or simply killing vectors, arise because of an underlying symmetry on the manifold. If the Lie derivative of the metric with respect to the vector field vanishes, then the vector field is a killing vector field. So let's start by looking at the Lie derivative on a two-dimensional manifold. So here's our two-dimensional manifold, and here is, you can imagine, these lines in this direction, mu, and these lines in this direction, lambda, and uh, if you like, if it helps, think of this as a Cartesian plane, and this is y equals, say, 2, or some other number, y equals 2 line, and this one here, this vertical line, you can think of this as, say, x equals 3. This is a way of uh, parameterizing it in your mind, just thinking about it. All right. Each of these curves, coordinate curves, has its own tangent vector at all points. So each point on the coordinate curve will have its own tangent vector. And together, these curves form a congruence. And these tangent vectors form a vector field on that congruence. All right, so pick a curve here. And we can parameterize it in terms of lambda and set mu is equal to constant. So mu is constant along here. Uh, and it's lambda that varies as we go across. And so the derivative, the tangent vector, will be dxi lambda d lambda. That gives us the tangent vector at any point. All right, now let's say some scalar function f is defined on this manifold. Then the directional derivative of the function f at any point along the curve xi, in the direction of the tangent vector ui is given by df d lambda is u i df dxi. So the subject here. Now the Lie derivative generalizes the directional derivative of a scalar function to higher rank tensors. So let's just come back here to the Lie derivative of a scalar function in the direction of the tangent vector u, and that is the Lie derivative of the scalar function f in direction u is this object here, which is just as we saw earlier, the usual directional derivative we're familiar with. All right, now let some vector field v be defined on the manifold then the Lie derivative of this vector field in the direction of the tangent vector field u is given by this object here. Now this has been, I've dealt with this in a previous video, so if you have a look at that, you'll see how this was derived. Now, the Lie derivative of a covariant vector, or one form, w subscript i, can be found from the Lie derivative of the scalar f, which results from the inner scalar product of a vector with a one form. So the Lie derivative of this scalar, this object here, is the Lie derivative of this object equals this. And we'll see what that looks like in a moment. Alright, so I'm left here, the Lie derivative of this scalar object here, which is the scalar product of a vector with a one form, and it's equal to this object over here. So we'll expand out both sides. On the left, the product rule, or Leibniz rule, applies to this product. And the same over here on the right. Okay, now the Lie derivative of a vector, here we are. Familiar is our one form here, or a covector, or the subject here. And we expanded this out, multiplying throughout by uj. Now, when we expand out this, multiply throughout the wi, the component wi, um, and we're still left with the subject. And ultimately, it's the subject here we want to find. On the right hand side, we've got this. Now, this first term here cancels out with this uh, other term over here. Alright, you can see the indices match up, and that cancels out, and that leaves us with three terms in this equation. This term here, and then this object here. Now we'll move this over to the right, so we'll end up with this object here. All right, we're almost there. Notice there's a V superscript I here, V superscript I here, but this one is V superscript J. That's all right, this J and this J, just like this I and this I are dummy indices, we can swap them. We're free to label them whatever we like. So we'll just swap them. So next line down 
the J's have swapped with the I's, and we have VI, V superscript I here, V superscript I here, same over here, so we can divide through, cancel them out, and we're left with the lead derivative of a one form, or covector, and here it is. Going over. Alright, so the lead derivative of a one form, or covector, is this object here. Now, rank 2 tensor can be expressed as this product here, outer product, this, these two components. This is a rank 2 tensor covariant in both indices. So the lead derivative of this rank 2 covariant tensor is this object here. Product rule applies again, and when we expand it out, this is what we get. Now, what we're going to do here is this term here, with the UK in front, and this term here with the U superscript K in front, we're going to express that as the partial derivative of their product, and of course expanding that out because it's this term and this term. So this this line here with four terms in it can be shrunk down to this line here with three terms. Right, now, replacing W subscript I times w, the V subscript J, sorry, with this object here, which is the rank 2 tensor, same all the way along here, gives us the lead derivative for a rank 2 tensor covariant in both indices. All right, so this means that the lead derivative of the metric tensor is just replaced the previous one with G uh, subscript IJ, covariant metric tensor, is this object here, as we found. And just reminding ourselves again of the manifold, the coordinate curves are a manifold form of congruence, so these coordinate curves form a congruence, while their tangent vectors generate a vector field on that congruence, congruence of curves, that is. All right, we choose one of our coordinate curves to be x1, lambda, u equals constant, mu equals constant, sorry. x1 of lambda is lambda, just for argument's sake, say, and u1 will be the x1 of lambda d lambda is 1, so the components of the, uh, the u1 component is constant. Since these tangent vectors are constant vectors, then the partial derivative of these tangent vectors will disappear. And the lead derivative, as we saw on the previous page, simply becomes this object here, this partial derivative with respect to lambda of the first term. Now, if the lead derivative vanishes, then the metric must be independent of the coordinate lambda. And this means that the metric does not change along the direction of the tangent vector field as it moves along the congruence of coordinate curves. A vanishing lead derivative of the metric occurs for every symmetry in the manifold, and for any direction in which the metric does not change, there is said to exist an isometry. Setting the lead derivative of the metric to zero leads to the Killing equation, the solutions of which are the isometry directions of the manifold. So they're the directions of which the manifold doesn't change. So to see that, let's have a look here, let's go back to the lead derivative of the metric tensor. Here we are. And what we're going to do is we're just going to rewrite this second and third term in this form here as so a derivative of a product minus uh, a part of that object. Now, expanding this out and subtracting that will give us this term back. Same here, uh, taking the partial derivative of both terms in here, and um, then subtracting that object there will give us this one here. When we do that, we can use the metric here to lower this index k to give us uj, and the same over here, use the metric here to lower the index k, uh, that's to sum out the index k, and that leaves us with this subscript i here. All right. Now we can collect this term, the fourth one, and the second one, put them over here, and over here we notice that we have uk, 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 and partial to the metric tensor. So put them together like that. Factorise out the UK and a minus sign, and gives us this object here. And this looks like the affine connection, which is what it is. Uh, not sorry, the um, Christoffel symbol of the first kind, which is what it is. Right. Um, or the affine connection with a lowered index. It's the Christoffel symbol of first kind. In fact, it looks like two of them. So it's two times the Christoffel symbol of first kind, and that gives us this object here. All right. And what we can then do is uh, lower this index and raise the k. That gives us the affine connection, or the Christoffel symbol of the second kind, and we can then separate those because there's two of them. And this gives us the covariant derivative of the vector u, uh, and it gives us both indices swapped. Now this situation here, if it's equal to zero, 
then that says that the lead derivative of the metric tensor is zero if this condition here is obeyed. And this is the covariant derivative of the vector u um, with the indices swapped. So the Killing equation, as this is known, is this object here that we've just found. And the solutions of this equation are the Killing vectors that identify the symmetry directions on the manifold concern. That is, they represent those directions in which the metric is not changing. Now, if M and N are two Killing vectors on some manifold, then so is their linear combination. So a linear combination of any Killing vectors is itself another Killing vector. And we're done.